on this Monday night. BC's interior on high alert. Water is now flowing over an enormous landslide. The fears a dam could soon burst. Only time will tell as we move through this process and move through this natural disaster. The flood preparations and the evacuation orders. Debbie douses Florida. There's so many cars that are underwater. Where the tropical storm is headed next. Market misery. What prompted stocks to plummet and the advice to investors. And basking in the glow of Olympic gold. I don't think it's sunk in at all. It's been a, a crazy whirlwind of emotions. Two history-making Canadian Olympians on their medal hall. Global National with Donna Friesen. Reporting tonight, Tracy Tong. Good evening and thank you for joining us. Communities in British Columbia's interior are on edge tonight as they await a potentially dangerous flood of water days after a landslide blocked a major river. Here now, close as I can, we're being told to leave, head back right now to get away. Water is now spilling over what had become a natural dam, blocking the Chilcotin River in the Caribou Regional District. The landslide caused a lake to form. It's roughly 11 kilometers long and holds around 61 million cubic meters of water. I cannot underline enough how extremely unstable and dangerous the valley is right now. It is extremely unsafe to be in the landslide and surrounding areas. Now that the water has begun flowing past the natural dam, there is a risk of further landslides, both upstream and downstream of the, of the dam. Evacuation orders and alerts have been issued for multiple areas near the slide along the Chilcotin River and the Fraser River, which it flows into. Even beyond the region, people are advised to avoid the riverbanks in anticipation of a rush of water. The province has issued flood warnings and watches as far south as the town of Hope. And that is where we find Grace Key. Grace, how are communities further south preparing for this? Yeah, we're just next to the Fraser River in Hope where signs are in place warning residents to stay clear because of that flood watch. Now closer to the affected area, residents are certainly on edge as the water is beginning to flow over the landslide. The water levels are expected to be the same as spring flooding, but the real concern is just how fast and fierce that water will make its way down to communities. The worst case scenario is now less likely. The best case scenario is still that it would take 12 to 24 hours for the trapped water to move through and pass the blockade. Everyone's really sitting on edge because we just don't know how it's going to release. It's good to hear some of the projections that they have and some of the modeling around what happens if it all releases at once and what, what those water levels are going to look like. Uh, but, um, you know, only time will tell as we move through this process and move through this natural disaster. So this is all the best information that they have for now. So things are still changing. Teams remain near the site and they are keeping a close eye for any changes. Tracy. Grace Key in Hope, B.C. for us. Thanks, Grace. In Alberta, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau met with firefighters and evacuees near the town of Jasper, Alberta, more than a week after the community was ravaged by wildfires. Trudeau was given a status update on the fire that's forced more than 20,000 people from their homes and went on to destroy a third of the popular tourist town. Today, residents who lost their homes were given a chance to survey the damage on a bus tour. A 24-year-old firefighter died over the weekend. In the U.S., Tropical Storm Debbie is pounding Florida. The nasty weather front made landfall this morning as a Category 1 hurricane, with winds reaching up to 130 kilometers per hour. About 250,000 people were left without power, and at least four people have been killed. We're ready to assist. We want to assist. Uh, we mentioned constructing about 94 hundred feet of flood protection devices supporting critical critical infrastructure against flooding from the storm. This has been done for things like hospitals in the past. And our global news meteorologist Ross Hull is tracking this system for us. Ross, where is Tropical Storm Debbie heading? 
Well, Tracy, Debbie may have weakened since it made landfall as a Category 1 hurricane around the Grand Bend region of Florida earlier this morning, but it is still a tropical storm, and there is the concern for potential for catastrophic flooding over the next few days as this storm slowly pushes towards the southeast coast of the U.S., not to mention storm surge and also severe weather. The center of the storm now moving towards northern Florida, as you can see from that cloud top satellite imagery. And as we bring in the radar, you can see all the heavy rain surrounding the system along with lightning. And that's the concern as it slowly pushes over the southeast U.S. coast making its way back over the water at times, which could restrengthen it then back inland. But this is all over the course of the week. And what it could deliver is historic rainfall causing devastating flooding. Some areas could see more than two months worth of rain in just a matter of days. And then the remnants of the storm later this week likely will have weakened, but could still provide some heavy rain towards the Maritimes and Atlantic Canada by the weekend. We'll keep an eye on that and Tracy, this is certainly not the peak of the Atlantic hurricane season. That doesn't happen until September, so likely more storms to come. All right, Global News meteorologist Ross Hull. Thank you, Ross. Canadian markets are closed for the civic holiday, but around the world, it has been a brutal day for stocks. The American markets suffered their worst day since 2022. The Nasdaq plunged the most, 3.4%. The sell-off was even worse in Japan, where the Nikkei fell by over 12 percent, its worst day since the Black Monday crash of 1987. And as Bianca Faschini reports, it's the fallout from surprisingly poor economic data out of the U.S. that has some raising the possibility of a recession. Global markets remained jittery on Monday after fears of a faltering U.S. economy spread around the world. This was expected. Uh, it all started with uh, international and global queues and uh, the fear of recession to some extent. The sell-off started in Asia, with Japan's Nikkei suffering its biggest drop in 37 years. European stocks also fell sharply, followed by dips in the U.S. markets. Even gold, typically seen as a haven during tumultuous times, slid downward. The markets were reacting to a slew of economic data here in the U.S. The latest monthly jobs report showed that the unemployment rate ticked up to 4.3 percent from 4.1 percent. And another report showed that U.S. manufacturing activity is still shrinking. While the numbers set off some alarm bells, it hasn't totally changed the outlook on Wall Street, in part because interest rates are expected to go down soon, like they have in Canada. We expect better things in the global economy and the U.S. economy after we see some rate cuts from the Fed. And another expert says the average investor shouldn't make any sudden moves. If you were planning on retiring on September 1, you should be worried. Uh, if you're not planning on retiring for 20 years, 30 years, uh, this isn't going to change any of your plans in any way. And so the, the worst thing that you can do now is buy into the panic. For Canadian investors, Monday's holiday could mean losses Tuesday as the market catches up to the rest of the world. And in the U.S., the focus remains on the Federal Reserve and whether officials will lower interest rates during the next meeting in September. Bianca Faschini, Global News, Washington. U.S. President Joe Biden returned to the White House today for a meeting on the crisis in the Middle East. Biden convened his national security team to discuss ways to de-escalate tensions and avoid a wider conflict. He also spoke to Jordan's King Abdullah. The leaders agreed on the need for an immediate ceasefire and hostage release deal. The U.S. is also deploying more military equipment to the Middle East. Last week, the top leader of Hamas was killed in Iran. Israel is accused of ordering the assassination, but has not claimed responsibility. Authorities in Bangladesh are trying to restore order after weeks of violent anti-government protests. Nearly 300 people have been killed since protests began mid-July. Thousands more have been injured. Bangladesh's Prime Minister, Sheikh Hasina, has resigned and fled the country. She had been in power for 15 years and was re-elected for a fourth term in January. The country's military chief says it will stand down and help form an interim government. Protesters hope this will lead to meaningful change. But as Heidi Petrachik reports, there's international worry about Bangladesh's political future. 
Protesters in Bangladesh swarmed a statue depicting the father of their former prime minister after Sheikh Hasina resigned Monday fleeing the country. Activists storming what was her official residence. Massive crowds took to the streets of the capital proclaiming victory. Bangladesh has been engulfed by protests, first led by students for weeks, over corruption, high unemployment and concerns Hasina, once seen as a pillar of democracy, has become increasingly authoritarian. As anger has boiled over, so too has violence, with reports of nearly 100 people killed Sunday alone. In East End Toronto, the heart of Canada's Bangladeshi community, there's a sense of celebration. We are waiting for 20 years for this day. We are happy. We are very happy. My mom, she went to the streets today. My brother, he was out on the streets. He's waving the flag. And in Halifax, this university student worries about her family in Dhaka, watching from afar as student groups demanded an end to a controversial quota system. It determines just who can gain the security of government employment and favors descendants of freedom fighters who helped Bangladesh gain independence in 1971, a system younger generations deem no longer fair. Should just be basic human rights, so why should I not have that? Over the past several weeks, Bangladeshi Canadians have been holding rallies like this one in Halifax in support of the student protests. And while there's relief now that the Prime Minister has resigned, there's also some anxiety over what could come next. There is a sense of urgency, there's a sense of uncertainty all throughout the nation right now. So we don't know who is going to be the next government. Bangladesh's Army Chief General has announced an interim government will be formed. World leaders want those in positions of power to uphold their commitment to democracy. Bangladeshis in Canada are urging Ottawa to deny asylum to any former members of the Bangladeshi government. Heidi Petrachik, Global News, Halifax. A crackdown on violent protests in the UK. Coming up, the government's goal to stop demonstrations that erupted after a deadly stabbing rampage. In the UK, authorities say about 400 arrests have been made following violent demonstrations. They were sparked by last week's mass stabbing at a Taylor Swift-themed dance class that left three children dead. The riots have recently targeted asylum seekers, fueled by online rumors surrounding the killings. As Crystal Gamansing reports, now the British Prime Minister has ordered a standing army of specialist police to deal with the unrest. With a major cleanup underway, authorities vow justice will prevail. This was an area that was uh, seized with shock and fear throughout yesterday. Those who descended on this hotel housing asylum seekers were called far-right thugs by the Prime Minister. The crowd smashed windows, set fires and attacked police. We have seen at least 12 of our officers injured with items such as bricks, fence posts, branches. For five days, violent unrest has swept across England and Northern Ireland. Unruly demonstrations fueled by disinformation following the killing of three little girls at a dance studio one week ago. False online reports said the attacker was an asylum seeker who arrived by boat in 2023. Police tried to correct the public record stating the 17-year-old accused was born in the UK. This is not protest. It is pure violence and we will not tolerate attacks on mosques or our Muslim communities. The Prime Minister held an emergency session with officials over the attacks. The Secretary of Defence met with people in Rotherham and the Home Secretary appeared on TV, all in an effort to assert control and restore calm. And total disgraceful criminal behaviour and we should be clear there will be a reckoning. Still, many non-white residents say they're feeling increasingly unsafe. It's demoralizing for to know that people in society can reach such a low point in their in their lives where um, attacks are happening. Given the violence, Canada and several other nations issued travel advisories warning citizens to exercise a high degree of caution if in the UK. Crystal Gamansing, Global News, London.
Tracking auto theft. Ahead, the new tech helping authorities recover stolen vehicles. Well, if you are one of the many car owners who put a tracking device inside your vehicle in case it's stolen, there is some good news tonight. A new federal program is committing to work with local police to help get it back. But as our chief investigative correspondent, Carolyn Jarvis, reports, if your vehicle reaches the Port of Montreal, where thousands get shipped overseas, you may be out of luck. If your stolen car has ended up here at the Port of Montreal, and your air tag shows it's somewhere in this pile of containers, the chances of getting it back may be slim. There are thousands of containers in the port. The air tag is not precise enough to give us a clear indication where the container is located. Which is why the Port of Montreal is partnering with Quebec-based TAG, another tracking company, to install receivers across the port. Eventually, we will have more uh, antennas and that will improve the process to locate more precisely and more rapidly fraudulent or uh, suspicious container. They're very small components. TAG is one of several tracking companies that have exploded in popularity in the face of auto theft. Five to seven of its devices are hidden in a TAG customer's vehicle. So even if thieves find one, they can still be tracked. So this is a tracking computer. We only need one unit to track the vehicle. Pinpoint in which container it is and what row of the, of the pile. In recent years, insurance companies in Quebec have required or incentivized the use of TAG, and the recovery was so effective that some believe that's why thieves shifted their focus to Ontario. So the criminals uh, were looking for vehicles that did not have those tracking devices on them. And that's what uh, really opened up the doors for these criminals to move to Ontario, the GTA. But the Canada Border Services Agency says stopping stolen cars at the port is not the goal. We're the last line of defense. And, and I think of combating auto theft as a team sport. We're the goalie. Ideally, our forwards and our defensemen are, are intervening sooner which is partly why the CBSA has developed a new program. What we've called the request to locate protocol. It's all premised on intervening as soon as possible, whether it's in a warehouse in the Toronto area, a rail yard in Winnipeg. So if I've got a vehicle with an air tag in it, I can call up the police? Call your place of local jurisdiction first, so your local police force. Uh, the commitment with the protocol is they will either intervene to find the vehicle. If it's not, then they'll work with other policing partners to do so. And do they have to? We can't guarantee that we'll recover the vehicle in every instance, but certainly we're doing our very best efforts to do so. The CBSA says anything to avoid looking in the proverbial haystack here will hopefully help you get your car back. Carolyn Jarvis, Global News, Montreal. Golden Glory. Next, Summer McIntosh and Ethan Katzberg reflect on their historic accomplishments. An electrifying and historic moment tonight in Paris. Sweden's Mondo Duplantis set a new world record in the pole vault, taking home the gold medal. He cleared a height of 6.25 meters. And there were no new medals today for Team Canada, but it was a day of positive reflection. Two of Canada's gold medalists spoke about their remarkable achievements. Our Redmond Shannon is following the Canadian results from Paris. Canada shooting for bronze in three-on-three -three basketball, falling just short to the U.S. on Place de la Concorde. Just down the Seine and under the Eiffel Tower, a win against the U.S., Melissa Humana Paredes and Brandy Wilkerson advancing to the beach volleyball quarterfinals. For Team Canada, much of Monday, though, was focused here at Canada Olympic House, dedicated to celebrating the successes of the games so far. For the Paris 2024 Olympic swimming team! Canada's swimmers with their haul of eight medals, half, of course, from a certain 17-year-old. The Toronto teen who is now a worldwide superstar. Sleep deprived and tired. Um, All that work course. earning McIntosh a page in the history books. The first Canadian to win three golds in one games. 
yeah, it's been great, but it'll definitely take a while for me to realize like what exactly we've done. And I think it'll sink in more once I head back to Canada. McIntosh said each of her four medals, including the silver, was special in its own way. For the Tuner to Fly, it is definitely one of my favorite events. And since my mom did that event back in 1984 at the Olympic Games, to get gold in that was a very special moment to share with her. Another Canadian history maker honoured on Monday. BC's Ethan Katzberg awarded his gold for Sunday's Hammer Final when he obliterated the competition with his very first throw. How soon when the hammer is gone? Is it still rising by the time you go? I've nailed it. That first throw, I knew I knew it was a good one. Um, I didn't know if it was going to be like 84. I, I knew it was over, maybe I, I knew it was over 82. Um, but but seeing 84 pop up is obviously a, a good feeling. Alas, today, day 10 of the games was the first in which Canada did not win a medal, a sign of how good things have been up until now. But on Tuesday, Cameron Rogers aims to make it a Canadian double in the hammer. Canadians are also competing in finals of diving and sailing too. Tracy? Redmond Shannon in Paris for us. Thank you, Redmond. And Canada is now in 11th place in the gold medal count. China is on top with 21. The U.S. has the most medals overall. And that is Global National for this Monday. I'm Tracy Tong. Tonight's Your Canada is some of our Olympians returning home. <laughs> Rugby Sevens players Charity Williams and Asia Hogan Rochester showed off their silver medals today in Toronto. It was Canada's best finish ever in the event. Thanks for watching. Carolyn Jarvis will be at the anchor desk tomorrow. Good night.